you are actually getting an inside glimpse at our church this morning because we are actually saying time out from our science series for one Sunday and the last Sunday of January every single year we call it Vision Sunday and we talk about what God has done in the last year at our church and then we look ahead at what God is challenging each and every one of us with for 2013 so if you're here watching online listening to the podcast, whatever it is, you're getting an inside glimpse at what Canyon Creek Church is all about and where we're going. So um, I, I want to mention one thing before I pray this morning. Uh, tonight is our annual vision meeting. It's our annual gathering of the members of our church, and it's at 6 p.m., and it is very important. If you're a member of the church, we really need you there tonight. There's some important information about the future of our church, things that we will be voting on, discussing, uh, and talking through. We want to make sure that we are all on the same page and uh, that we've answered any questions that people may have. So please make that a priority to be here. Uh, I also want to mention that we are electing potentially two new elders. And you'll notice inside of your programs information about uh, the two gentlemen that we've asked to serve to replace uh, uh, spots on our elder board. And basically the way that works is you come to the meeting, uh, one of our, our officers will talk about what our bylaws say about elders, and then we will do just a yes or no election on these two elders, but there's the info about them. If you have any questions, you can grab me or Christian after the service, and we can talk to you more about that. But that's tonight at 6 p.m., and again, it follows our annual chili cook-off at 4.30, and my wife is the reigning champ, so I tried her chili out last night, and uh, it's good. So, I mean, she's going to defend her crown. We'll see how it goes. And I'm a very impartial judge. I don't know which one's hers. So don't, you know, say I'm cheating when I judge. All right, bow your heads, close your eyes, let me pray. And we'll dive in this morning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for Canning Creek Church. Thank you for what you've done in 2012. It really was a great year. And sometimes I need to pause as the pastor of this church and just look at what you've done and just be in awe of it. And that's really where I was for this last year. I mean, what a great year we had. And as we look ahead this morning to 2013 and what you are challenging each one of us individually with, Lord, I ask that even now you would soften hearts and prepare them for what you are asking of them this next year. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, I do want to say it's my fault that... We uh, didn't have any parking for you when you came in earlier today for this service. It's my fault. I went a little bit long. I'm choosing to blame it on communion because then you can't be mad at me. Uh, so uh, on Facebook this week, on our Canyon Creek Church Facebook fan page, I highlighted some fun facts about our church in 2012. And some of you are thinking, the church has a fan page on Facebook? Yes, please find it and like it. But please don't post any constructive criticism on it, because I will erase it. No, it, it's for, uh, we want you to come, get information about the church, but please like us on Facebook. But I shared these fun facts about 2012, which I think are kind of cool. The first one is, did you know that in 2012, our church gave over $123,000 to missions? Isn't that cool? That was pretty cool. Did you also know that it was the first time in the history of our church where we had over a million dollars that came in and just tithed for our church? I'm pretty awesome when you consider that, uh, you know, our church is barely eight years old. It's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, another one of my favorite facts about our church, did you know that in 2012, 189 new families made Canyon Creek their church home. Pretty awesome. If I dove deeper into that statistic, it actually works out to a retention rate. Now, we chart what our retention rate is, and what I mean by that is when a family comes to our church the first time, we receive information from them and we follow up on them that the number of families that actually decide to make this their church home, it was 62% of the families that visited our church last year made this their church home. Okay, 
You, you, this isn't your world, but I have a PhD in church. Let me tell you how significant this is. The average church in America would have a retention rate of about 10 to 15 percent. A really strong retention rate would be about 30 percent. 62 percent for a church this size is like historic percentage, which means that the team that leads that department did a spectacular job this last year. She's also super cute. So, um, She's my wife, if you're wondering if I was talking about Ryan. He's a fine-looking man, but I wasn't referring to him. Um, and then, finally, I think this is the last fun fact that I'll share. 2012 was the first year in the history of our church where we averaged over 1,000 people each Sunday attending our services. Pretty awesome year. Okay, great year. Give yourselves a hand. You guys. Here's what this tells me about our church. This is what it tells me about you. I think it tells me as your pastor four things. It tells me, number one, the Canyon Creek Church is a generous church. That you are a generous group of people. Um, we don't have any rich people in our church, but we have a bunch of faithful, generous people. It also tells me that Canyon Creek Church is an attractional church. That if you are willing to invite people to church they're willing to come because we have a good reputation in this community that people are willing to come to this church. But not only is Canyon Creek an attractional church, but number three, Canyon Creek is a friendly church that when people come here for the very first time, they're greeted not only in the parking lot, not only by our greeters, but not only by our ushers and in our cafe, but they are engaged with a group of friendly people that are willing to open themselves up to relationship with them to the point where people are willing to come back and make this their church home. That's cool. And then the last thing it tells me about our church is that you have to deal with the fact, we have to deal with the fact that Canyon Creek Church is now a large church. Um, what does that mean for us moving forward? I want to talk to you about 2013. Uh, I also know one other fact about our church that we have an incredibly high percentage wise of people that are very physically active and physically fit. I mean, in this church, I mean, we have people that are heavily involved in mixed martial arts. They're involved in CrossFit training. Uh, they're involved in yoga, kettlebell, weightlifting, every team sport that is possibly imaginable. People run marathons. They do triathlons. Every time I read somebody's charting Facebook, they're charting how many miles they went running today. That is Canyon Creek Church. And this morning, as we look ahead to 2013, I want to appeal to the fitness addict inside of you. So I'm hoping to speak a little bit of your language. But before I dive into 2013, I want to remind you who we are and what our mission is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. This is the scripture that our mission statement as a church comes from. And it says this. We always thank God, this was Paul talking to the church in Thessalonica. He said, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father. So Paul is super thankful for this church and he's saying, when I pray about you and I think about you, I am amazed about the following factors of your character and your spiritual life. He says, we always remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith. So part of our mission statement is we want to be a people that live by faith. That our faith in Jesus is vitally important to our lives. That that faith in Jesus causes us to have faith and do big things. Which means we believe that with God, all things are possible. So as a church... We don't run around saying why we can't do something. We always say, why not? Let's try it for Jesus. We live by faith. It says, uh, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love. Now, our motivation should be love. 
that not only do we want to be a people that live by faith, but we want to be a people that are known by love. And that is why when a new person to our church says, I could not get over how friendly and inviting Canyon Creek Church is. It lets me know that the people in our church embody being known by love. I mean, that's the reputation we want in our community. We want people to think those people love other people. So live by faith, be known by love. And then finally, Paul said, and we remember your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've heard me say it once, you've heard me say it a thousand times, and you still have not heard me say it enough, Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Did you hear me say it? Jesus is the hope of the world. Not a politician, not your checkbook, not your job, not some social service, not being socially active, not social justice. Jesus Christ is is the hope of the world. And you and I exist to be a voice of hope to a lost and dying world which needs to know that reality. That, hey, Jesus loves you. He died for you. And he is your hope and your future. That church is, that's what our mission is. It's why we exist as a missional body missional group of believers. And in 2013, I shared with you several months ago that our focus for the year is that we are believing God for a ripple effect. And I told you what a ripple effect was, and I illustrated it by saying it's like taking a rock and you throw it into a body of water, that initial splash, it makes a ripple outward that we are believing that if we will do our part and we will make our splashes, that God will multiply our effort, that he will take the corporate effort of all of us individually and he will do something amazing through it. And the verse that I used was uh, 2 Thessalonians 3.1. And I said, this is what you and I are believing for. And it reminds us, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the gospel may spread rapidly. And church, that's what our prayer is. That this hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that the world would know it. And that maybe God would use you and I to make that word spread and spread rapidly. That is the ripple effect that we want to start in this community. And and I I shared this in all the other services. Um, I love coaching sports. I've coached sports my whole life. Um, And lately, I'm coaching my boys' sixth grade basketball team. Now, I am probably way too overly obsessed with this sixth grade basketball team. But here's my opinion. You go big or you go home. Everything in life, go big or go home. And when I think of believing that God is going to use us to see the gospel spread rapidly, it's like I hear the Holy Spirit whispering in all of our ears, go big or go home. That's what we're believing for. So in 2013, here's what I want you to do. Here is your pastor, your leader's challenge for you. Again, I'm appealing to the fitness Uh, addict inside of you. And some of you are like, I hate physical fitness. Well, you'll appreciate this message then uh, a lot. Uh, But I want to challenge you this year, stretch yourself. Stretch yourself. You're going to hear me ask you all year long, did you remember to stretch? Because this year, I believe God is going to stretch you. And some of you are saying, stretch? Man, I hated it when my coaches made us stretch. I hate stretching. Yeah, anybody that's into physical fitness, we we don't enjoy stretching. No one enjoys stretching, but we understand that stretching is a means to an end. That stretching, number one, it increases our flexibility. That the more we stretch, the more flexible we become, and the more flexible we become, the more physically active we can become, and the better we'll perform. Increases flexibility. You with me? You're going to get the metaphor in a second, I promise. 
Number two, if you stretch properly, it will decrease the chance of a long-term severe injury. Meaning that if you will cause yourself a minor amount of pain now, you will uh, alleviate a lot of potential pain in the future. That if you will remember to stretch and be uncomfortable now, it'll keep you from injuring yourself in the future. I, I always love to use the annual turkey bowl at Canyon Creek. All the guys get together at Jackson High School and we play football and hurt ourselves Thanksgiving morning. It's awesome. And uh, we showed up this year. It was about 30 guys there. It was about 20 degrees out because it was a beautiful fall day in Seattle as always. And uh, so the guys are circled up and about 25 of us are stretching. I mean, you got all these guys. It's cold. It's early in the morning. We're stretching out our hamstrings and our groin and our quadricep and our calves. And then we start stretching our deltoids and our biceps and our triceps. Also, we don't severely injure ourselves. We're fully planning on getting injured. But we just don't want it to be severe. But there's always those five guys that refuse to stretch. <laughs> Anyone that's into sports, you know those five guys, right? They're young and they're athletic. They don't need to stretch. So the first time they get the ball and they try to cut, they all of a sudden are like, oh, I think I pulled my hamstring because you didn't stretch. And then they always say afterwards, oh, I think I hurt myself. I wished I would have stretched. So why do you stretch? It increases flexibility. Why do you stretch? It decreases the chance of a permanent injury later on. But I realized that we don't like to stretch. We don't like stretching. And I, I thought about stretching and several things that I know about stretching is that it's not fun. Stretching's not fun. Some of you will say, yes, it is. No, it's not. And I know stretching better than you. And here's why. Because I just had my entire shoulder replaced. I mean, you'd had to be like living underneath a rock to not know, because I've talked about it so much over the last 12 months. But my entire right shoulder is titanium. I have a 23-inch scar right here. This is all metal. They cut off my humerus, put in a metal ball, and I was told by my surgeon that the key to recovery from this surgery is my disciplining myself in my rehab. And he said the key to your rehabilitation is stretching. He says if you do not stretch, you do not discipline yourself, and force yourself to stretch. He said, all the work that I have done on your shoulder will be a waste of time. So here's what I was required to do. For the first three months, I had to stretch my shoulder five times a day. One cycle of stretching took 40 minutes. So five times a day, 40 minutes a pop, I had to stretch nonstop for three straight months. Okay, you quickly, do some quick math. That's three and a half hours a day of stretching. I beat you. Okay? And my staff will tell you, as they know, Brandon did this. They've traveled with me, and they've seen me in my office. They would knock on my office door, and I'd say, come in, and I'd be on the ground. They'd be, what are you doing? I'm stretching. Orders from the doctor. After three months, I was allowed to decrease my stretching to three times a day at 40 minutes a pop. Wow, only two hours a day. Yay. And then after, that after those first six months, I was allowed to go down to one time a day, but it was for the, it's for the rest of my life. That for the rest of my life, I have to stretch out my shoulder for 40 minutes a day. And I do that to increase and maintain my flexibility in my arm. I do that to increase and maintain the strength in my arm. As soon as I stop doing that, my arm could freeze up. And you know what? It's not fun. I dread it. It hurts. It's uncomfortable. People look at me weird when I do it. Um, I, I don't like knowing that my daily schedule is wrapped around me remembering to stretch. Before I come up to preach so that I can be Italian and move my arm around, I have to stretch. This is what it's like. I realize stretching isn't fun. Um, especially when you're younger, stretching feels like a waste of time. If you, all you want to do is get into the main activity. 
You don't want to take the time to stretch. I mean, I got together with a group of buddies, man. We want to play basketball. We don't want to stretch for 15 minutes beforehand. We want to start shooting hoops. So it seems like a waste of time. Um, another thing about stretching is that it's uncomfortable. You don't stretch your muscles to the point where they really hurt. That means you are, you're actually not stretching appropriately and, and the right way. You stretch yourself to the point where it starts feeling uncomfortable. Now, the most people, we don't like doing anything that feels uncomfortable at all. But we stretch ourselves to the point where it feels uncomfortable because a little bit of uncomfortable now keeps us from pain later on. Okay, follow me. The metaphor is going to come in just a second. It's coming. And probably the last thing I would say about stretching is uh, it never ends. You know, there's some things in life, the older you get, you don't have to do as much because you, you know it better. But the older you get, the more you have to stretch. Stretching never ends. I, at 42 years old, I have to stretch way more now than I ever did when I was 22. So you have to stretch yourself more the older you get. If not, you will become an invalid and physically inactive. Like, for example, not because of the invalid and physically inactive. Christian, 43, 44 years old, Christian has to stretch before he comes to work in the morning. Just so he can make it through a work day. This is what happens when you're old. Poor Heather. Heather has to do a full series of stretching just so she can walk from here to the cafe. I didn't get heckled this service, so. You know why? It's because Heather's in this service, and some of you are like, I can't laugh. Brandon is in trouble. No, the, the older you get, the more you have to stretch. That, I, I say all that out of love. Okay, we're Xing that one from the podcast because no one laughed in this service. So the first two services, they win, you lose. Okay, so I want to challenge you to stretch yourself. And here's the three ways I want you to stretch yourself. Is everybody with me? You got it? So God has something big for our church in 2013. And we need to make sure that we stretch ourselves so we're ready for what God has for us. Number one, you need to stretch yourself spiritually. Uh, church, I'm telling you, God wants to stretch you spiritually. He wants you to pray like you've never prayed before. This year, you need to study the word of God. You need to stretch yourself. This year, you need to stretch yourself in your worship. There are some of you, um, you've heard us talk about praying and fasting, and you've never tried fasting. This year, stretch yourself spiritually. Make a decision to fast. When we launch this 30 days of prayer and fasting next week, which leads up to the launch of our Mill Creek campus, I want to challenge you personally. Yes, you. I dare you. You need to fast. You need to de deny yourself something that you want for the sake of something bigger happening corporately in our church. You need to say, you know, maybe I'll fast food. Maybe you'll fast coffee. Maybe you'll fast TV. I don't care what it is, but challenge yourself this year to fast. Some of you, the stretching for you is you need to start memorizing scripture. You need to take God's word and you need to hide it in your heart. You would say, well, I don't even know where to start. Just about every single Sunday, I give you a scripture to memorize. Make a decision this year. Every other time I challenge you to memorize the scripture, say, you know what, I'm going to take time that week and I'm going to memorize the Bible that week. Make a decision this year, you are going to stretch yourself in serving in ministry. One of our goals for 2013 is we want to activate 300 new people to find an area of ministry. And we want to challenge it to be you. If you've been someone, all you've done is attend church, I want to challenge you to get involved in ministry. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor Brandon, man, I was here in the very beginning. I have put in my time. Let me tell you, you have eaten up that seed. That seed is you are not reaping on it anymore. You need to invest. Never stop serving. Find an area to serve. Stretch yourself. For some of you, you attend church once or twice a month. Try three or four times a month. Some of you, uh, you sign up for a growth group, but you never attend. Attend. You know I'm talking to you. 
Um, stretch yourself this year. There's some of you, you need to stretch yourself by saying, I, I have never been to a men's breakfast, and I need to go to a men's breakfast. Um, a women's retreat, totally uncomfortable. Yeah, stretching's uncomfortable. Go to a women's retreat. Not if you're a man. It probably would be a good place to pick up chicks, but it's not here. Um, stretch your, what is going on, Brandon? Okay, um, stretch yourself spiritually this year. Stretch yourself. Make yourself uncomfortable spiritually. Because God wants to do something big through us. And let me be honest, who we are right now spiritually is not who we need to be to see what God wants to do through us. All of us have to figure out where we're at and we have to stretch ourselves spiritually. Not only do I want you to stretch yourself spiritually, but number two, I want you to stretch yourself relationally. I want to share with you this morning a dirty little secret that only pastors know. And this is pastors universal, okay? This is what we as pastors universal know about the Christians that attend our church. Okay, I'm sure I'm not talking about you personally. I might be talking about someone around you. Maybe I'm talking about someone at some other church that you know. Um, but this is what we know about people. That the average person who uh, says they're a Christian, attends church, maybe even serves and gives, that the average person would prefer that their church had about 80 people in it. Because what they really want is they want to, be, to know everyone and to be known by everyone. They want a handful of friends that they recognize and they see every single Sunday. They want to have people that they can live life with. That's the average person. Would like a church of about 80 people. But they expect the church to have the ministry of a church of a thousand. Yes, I only want 80 people in the church, but you better have a good youth ministry. You better have a rockin' children's ministry. The worship better be awesome. The preaching better be good, and there better be some thought to adult discipleship. So that's what we realize. Um, and, and let me even be more serious about that dirty little secret that all pastors know, but we're afraid to say publicly is that the average person that attends church says they care about their neighbor finding Jesus, but practically really don't. What they care about is that they have friends. Um, and I want to say, as your pastor, don't be average. Don't be like everyone else. Stretch yourself relationally. And here's what I mean by that. I want you to find at Canyon Creek Church lifelong relationships. I hope you're beginning to develop some of those. I love it when people have great friends in this church. I really do. But that is not the goal. The goal isn't that you find three or four families that your kids get to grow up with and you guys be best friends with and you live life together and it's you four and no more. That is not the goal. You see, I want to challenge you to stretch yourself relationally and open yourself up to new relationship. Because here's what happens. When you finally have the courage to leverage your relationship with people you know that don't go to church and you invite them to church and they come, you are hoping beyond hope that when they come to Canyon Creek the first Sunday, it's not going to be an off Sunday. You know how I know that? Because usually when somebody finally gets a friend to come to church, they call me. And they want to make sure that all the staff is there. They want to make sure, okay, this isn't one of those Sundays where we don't have any greeters or ushers or something like that. Because I have a friend that I'm bringing and I want them to have a really good experience. I hear that over and over again. How do we make sure that when you leverage your relationships, you invite your friends, coworkers, family members to church, they have a good experience. How do we do that? When every single person that's here stretches themselves relationally and opens themselves up to new relationships, which means sometimes you need to join a growth group where your two best friends aren't in it. Sometimes when your two best friends decide to take a semester off from growth groups, 
you do it anyways. Huh? Wow, that's daring. Sometimes when you come to church and you sit by the same people every single Sunday, sometimes you need to look around and have an eye open for someone that was like you when you first started coming here. The one cool thing about being a new church is every one of you are new. I mean, nobody's been, no one's been here for 10 years. We haven't been around for 10 years. I mean, most of you haven't even been around here for three years. So we're all new. So like it was for you when you first came, you need to keep your eye open for other people that are new when they get here and maybe introduce yourself to them and sit by them like someone did for you. But you need to stretch yourself relationally. Um, sometimes... You go to a men's weekend, not because you're interested in the topic, but because maybe there's someone there that God wants you to become friends with. You know, sometimes you go to a, a women's retreat, not because you feel like you need all these relational connections, but because someone needs to be relationally connected to you. You need to stretch yourself relationally. That's how we are on this mission together. That, that's how we're on it together. Are you with me? Stretch yourself spiritually, stretch yourself relationally, and finally, I want to challenge you to stretch yourself ideologically. Some of you are like, Brandon, come on, ideologically, you're trying to be like Christian and use a big word. <laughs> I went to college too. Now, what I mean by that is on March 3rd, we are launching our Mill Creek campus. That's going to change everything. It's an absolute game changer. It is going to make you feel uncomfortable, some of you. Some of you that have been around here before, that are kind of more naturally traditional church-wise, us going multi-campus is going to mess with you. And I want to tell you that this multi-campus concept, we didn't come up with this because other churches are doing it. Okay, Long before we ever launched Canyon Creek Church, when there was a group of 10 of us sitting in my office in Modesto, California, we talked about someday we are going to multiply, not just with services, with campuses. So we have been intending on doing this since before the church ever began. Now, there's been all kinds of circumstances and selling buildings and moving buildings and relocating and things that have made us delay eventually doing this, but this has been in our long-term strategy all along. We have wanted to do this. So if you've gone through 101 or you've heard me preach about this over the last few years, we were serious about it. We weren't just saying it because it was like the cool thing to say to do. Now, we are fully planning on going multi-site. And here's why we're going multi-site. Because we believe it is the best way for us to fulfill the mission God has given us. That we have a mission to be a voice of hope to a lost and dying community that desperately needs Jesus. And we believe the best way for us to do that is to reproduce ourselves in all these different communities. And, and I've said this over and over again every single service that I don't just feel like it is a mission from God. I feel like uh, in a mission statement, sometimes they're a cliche and you have to have them and nobody lives according to them. But I believe that our mission isn't just a mission, it is a mandate from God, that we are called by God to spread the gospel rapidly in this community, that we have got to be willing to risk everything to fulfill the will of God for this church. And it is going to stretch you. Some of you, I mean, when you think church, you think all of us coming together in one building, like having multiple services in a church, that's a stretch. Having a church of over 100 people, that is a stretch. Not knowing who's going to be where on what Sunday, all that is just like messing with you. Um, and that's okay. It's good for you. Stretching is uncomfortable. It's not fun. But in the end, it makes you more flexible. And it's good. And here's the hardest part is the older that we are, and I even lump myself into that category. Like I'm in my 40s, so I'm like getting older, um, at least for Canyon Creek purposes. Uh, but the older we are, the, the less flexible we tend to be when it comes to our view of church. And the older we are, the more we have to remember to stretch ourselves in our thinking. And some of you are going to say, oh, Pastor Brandon, man, Hey, I just feel uncomfortable about this. 
And the number of people that come to me and express something that fits in this category, I feel uncomfortable but, or I don't have peace about this. And most of us, when we don't feel comfortable with something or we don't have peace about something, we naturally fall back and assume that that must not be the will of God then because I don't have peace about it. I don't feel comfortable about it. And I want you to hear me say, just because you don't feel comfortable with something, whatever it is, doesn't mean it's not the will of God. Do you really think Jesus had peace when he was being nailed to a cross? Do you really think Jesus was feeling really comfortable when he was getting crucified? No. You cannot use peace as a determination whether or not something is right or wrong. Oftentimes, we do something and the peace comes later on. I'll tell you, I, I bet Jesus started feeling comfortable after he was resurrected. <laughs> peace probably came at the resurrection. But I want to challenge you. Stretch yourself spiritually. Stretch yourself relationally. Stretch yourself ideologically. Um, in the end, God is going to do something amazing through us. And can I tell you, what is the coolest thing about you being a part of Canyon Creek Church is that people will take one look at me and never give me any credit. Okay, so people aren't going to say, wow, man, that, happened. that was Brandon's church. They're going to say, they're going to scratch their head and think, how the heck did that happen? That is because God uses all of us so this will be a church that God will move forward and it will grow in spite of me. It'll be because of all of us. And that's the cool thing, but it's going to take every single one of us saying, if this is what God wants to do, who I am right now spiritually isn't who I need to be. If this is what God wants to do, who I am right now relationally isn't who I need to be. If this is what God wants to do, then my ideas and my thoughts about church probably isn't what they need to be. If, I'm gonna, if we are really going to be everything that God has for us moving forward, it's going to stretch us. Don't forget to stretch. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and uh, they are going to hand out these little vision cards. This is something that we give out every single year. This is not something for you to recycle. It's uh, not something for you to toss in the garbage. This is something that we actually made it on a neat little magnet to make it even more convenient. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on a file cabinet in your office. Put this somewhere where you will see it often. And whenever you see it, here's what your job is. To stop and for a moment pray for the church. Say, Lord, use us to see this happen. And the reason that we actually have goals, and I'm not going to go through them. You can read them. The reason that we do this, this is how we were able to give $123,000 to missions. Because our goal last year was to give $100,000 to missions. So we articulate something. We call them our BHAGs, our big, hairy, audacious goals. It's from a book. Um, and we believe God. We swing for the fences. We believe for something great. Are you guys with me? Is everybody still tracking with me? Okay. I'm going to tell you a story and I'm done. I've said this story a lot lately. When I was a senior in high school, um, I was on our high school soccer team. And my senior, I went to a small, private, Christian prep school in Seattle. And... Uh, it was our first year having varsity soccer. And actually, some guys that are here in our church were on my soccer team in high school and will remember this. Um, we had a great first varsity season. And at the end of the year, we made the state tournament. And so we were sitting down with our coach. His name was Bill Hermy. And uh, he was congratulating us for making state. We were the first team in the history of our school to make state in a sport. And so he looked at us and he said, guys, 
what you have done this year is almost impossible. Taking a team uh, that had never been varsity before, we actually went undefeated during the regular season, and he said, you guys were undefeated, you made state. He goes, this is a win, because it's a total victory. You guys have done things that are completely unexpected. And he said, we could stop right now right here and feel like our entire season was an absolute success and not win another game. And we're all like, yeah, it's cool. We get state patch on our letterman's jacket. Awesome. But then he leaned in. Remember, 12 really, you know, good Christian school kids. And he leans in and he looks at us and he says, well, you know what I think? He said, I think we have an outside shot. He said, I think we have a chance to do something that people will be talking about for years. He said, I think we have a shot at winning the whole profanity-laced thing. Let me put stinking in there. That kind of fits. So we could be content or we could try to win the whole stinking thing. (laughs) You know, I'm a senior in high school. I got my best friends there. By the time we left, we're like, let's go big or go home. Let's go hard or go home. If we got a chance to win the whole stinking thing, Let's win the whole stinking thing. Here's what I believe Jesus is saying to Canyon Creek Church. You ready? Win the city. Win the city. Well, you're you're serious. Jesus, you want us to try to win the city? We could be content where we are. I mean, what we are, we're a great church. We're a historic church. Most new church plants, in fact, 40% of church plants don't even survive five years. Out of the, the ones that do survive, most never reach 200 in weekly attendance. The average church in America, like the average person in America appreciates, only has 80 people in it. We are right now, Canyon Creek Church, we're not even 10 years old. We are one of the top 10% largest churches in America right now. We could pause and say, it's all good. What God has done, this is good. And we can be content or we can try to win the whole stinking thing. Church, Let me tell you who God made me. I have one life to live. And when I die and I go to heaven, I want to take as many people with me as I possibly can. And I wonder, could we influence a region? Could we reach this entire city? Could we reach this entire county? I don't know if it's possible, but let's die trying. Let's try to win the whole stinking thing for the glory of God. Let's tell people about Jesus. Let's bring to heaven as many people as we can with us. Are you ready to stretch yourself? Because who we are now, we're not who we need to be, but we could be. Everybody stand up on your feet. I want to pray for you. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to stretch out your hands up to heaven. And the reason I want you to do that is because I want you to feel uncomfortable. I don't raise my hands, Brandon. Good, raise them up. Stretch yourself. Here's the deal. If you don't raise your hand, everybody else is, and it really makes you stand out. Heavenly Father, you see 
all the hands that are stretched out. And Lord, we as a church say, all we want to do is tell people about you, Jesus. And we ask in all humility that right now, here in this place, that maybe you would see fit to use us. And Lord, we are ready to give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor for everything that happens. We only ask that we be your hands, we be your feet, that we be your mouth to communicate the message of the gospel to this community. And Lord, we don't even know what this means, but we ask that you would stretch us in Jesus' name. Use us in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. I want you to grab a seat really quick if you would. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. I have a connection card somewhere. There it is. As you're preparing for your offering, would you grab your connection card, flip it over to the back, there's that box that says my next step today, and you'll notice that I have provided several next steps for you. They're actually fairly intuitive with the message, um, but the big one that I really want you to think through is next week when we challenge you to sign up for this 30 days of praying and fasting, let's all partner together. Let's pray and fast and believe that from the moment we launch this Mill Creek campus, that God sovereignly blesses it, that he breathes on it, that something supernatural takes place, that because of our willingness to stretch ourselves, that God will just blow the roof off this place. That's what my prayer is. That's what my hope is. That is what I'm believing for. And I'm asking that you would partner with me in praying and fasting and believing for our church. So in just a moment, I'll pray when the buckets are passed. I want you to toss in your connection card and also your offering envelope. But let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the generosity of the people in this church. I ask that you would continue to bless the finances of this church. Bless each family individually and bless us corporately. And Lord, as we check these boxes on this connection card this morning, may it be a covenant that we are making in our heart. Lord, bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church this morning. 
Uh, we want to highlight something in your program. Starting point is our uh, class that we have for people that are exploring faith in Jesus. There's information about it in your program. On your way out, if you would just do us a favor, recycle your program and also your growth group catalog. If you want to talk to me, I'll be hanging out in the lobby. Don't forget to stretch. See you guys next week.